This is the last session of the workshop. And the first talk of the last session is by Alex from UC Berkeley. And the title is Data-Driven Estimation of Forward Reachable Sets. Alex? Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, can you hear you okay? Yes, clear. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm very happy to be the um, penultimate presentation at this workshop. <clears throat> um, so this presentation actually kind of rolls in very nicely um, from the previous one, because we're going to be doing some more consideration of reachability analysis um, for safety verification. In this case, we're going to be considering um, reachability analysis uh, more on its own, and specifically dealing with the question of um, sort of what kind of reachability analysis can you do under essentially kind of the minimum possible system assumptions. And so we're going to look at the research we've been doing for the last couple of years on various sort of statistical data-driven approaches. So the goal in this work that we've been doing is to estimate forward reachable sets um, using data that we can collect from black box systems. So these would be sort of systems where we don't really have any kind of um, analytical access to them, but we can sort of make like individual point evaluation to them. And so um, there are some clear examples of this in sort of um, physical experiment-based systems, but it also shows up in simulation type environments as well. So one instance of this would be when you have some system that has analytically intractable dynamics. So these would be dynamics that are sort of known mathematically in principle, but certain side information such as um, Jacobian matrices or monotonicity properties, which can be required for the more efficient methods of reachability analysis are not easy to compute or to assert that they verify certain bounds. <clears throat> and in these cases, um, it can be effective to treat them as a black box model, even though we do have some system information. A more extreme simulation-based example is when you have access to the system only through a high fidelity simulation model. So this would be um, a case where no explicit mathematical model is present. <clears throat> Um, and so the only way you can access the system is essentially through trajectory-based simulations. And so for systems of this sort, um, the traditional methods of reachability analysis, which provide guaranteed over approximations, um, we found that they aren't really able to work just because there's not enough information present from the black box models. We've been considering um, statistical methods that just use the point evaluation directly. And so in the statistical formulation, we find that we can get simple algorithms that um, satisfy probabilistic guarantees of their correctness instead of the more traditional, um, you know, sort of direct type of verification. And we furthermore find that these um, algorithms, which are essentially simulation-based or sample-based, also offer a great degree of freedom in giving a trade-off between the computation time in the sense of the number of simulations you need to do and sort of the geometric flexibility or like the expressiveness of the types of reachable set approximations you'll be able to make. And so in this presentation, we'll see a couple of examples of that. So this is more or less how the um, presentation is going to be organized. So first, I'll begin with a bit of um, problem background, where I'll discuss the specific type of reachability problem we're considering, and its probabilistic variant that we use as the basis of our analysis for the algorithms that we'll be considering. And once we've gone through that initial setup, um, we'll go through two specific methods um, that we've been investigating. Uh, the first of which is a method based on scenario optimization, which is based on recasting the statistical version of the problem as a chance constrained optimization problem, um, which yields a direct sampling based algorithm. And the second method is a method based on a class of polynomials called Christoffel functions, uh, which has seen various applications in data analysis in the last couple of years, and which we find has um, useful properties in this scenario as well. And once I've discussed these two methods, uh, we will um, conclude the presentation by discussing the computational perspectives in a little bit more detail. So let's go ahead with the um, problem background and the statistical setup. So I think most folks here are probably familiar with reachability analysis. Um, so this is essentially defining these specific problems that we're considering um, within the subfield of reachability and uh, sort of settling on some terminology. So what we're considering here is the problem of forward reachability analysis with a disturbance where we have a access to the system, again, through a black box model of its state transition function. And you'll notice here that we have an initial state and a disturbance. We don't consider an input here. So the types of models we're considering in this case are essentially ones where you um, 
sort of is either autonomous by nature or where you've fixed some control policy in place. And in that case, the disturbances can essentially represent um, some kind of deviations from the nominal control policy you selected. So once we have this um, part of the problem, we need to fix a little bit more problem data. And in particular, we'll fix, fix some subset of the state space, uh, which is of dimension NX here, which will be our initial set. And we will also fix a set of disturbances. And we'll also um, fix some time range T0 to T1. And so with this problem data fixed, we can define the forward reachable set as basically the set of all states that can be reached by the transition function, um, you know, subject to the constraints that we've listed out here. And under this setup, the goal of reachability analysis is to construct some kind of estimate um, for the forward reachable set. Um, so in order to proceed with the data-driven approach, um, what we've done is we've taken this problem and um, modified it slightly into a probabilistic or statistical variant. And we do this sort of statistical reframing in the following steps. So the first thing to do is to introduce some probability into this problem. So the black box model on its own may be deterministic, um, but in order to kind of define the sampling procedure sensibly, we're going to introduce some probability into the problem. So in this case, we would first replace the initial set with an initial random variable, where the support of that random variable is the same thing, but we now have essentially a probability distribution over the set of initial states. And similarly, we will replace the set of disturbances with a disturbance random variable, uh, which if the disturbances are fixed to constant values can be a random variable in the same sense as the initial state random variable. But if we allow the disturbance to be functions, it does become a bit trickier. In this case, you would need some kind of um, random variable over function, so a stochastic process essentially. So this could be, for instance, some sort of Gaussian process like Brownian motion or the like. And once we define um, these two random variables, this then induces a random variable over the forward reachable set, which we get by essentially taking our state transition function and applying the two uh, random variables we just defined into it. And then you know using t1 and t0 over the times as well. And so this defines the random set reachable or the uh, reachable set random variable r, which has a probability measure pr. And so this um, probability measure will be very important going forward because this is how we're going to measure sort of the accuracy of our reachable set approximations. Um, so since we are applying this black box model in this reachable set and random variable, we don't actually have any direct information um, about this probability distribution that this random variable has because it contains this unknown component. Nevertheless, we are still able to take samples from it since we have the black box model. To take a sample from the random variable r, we just need to take samples from the random variables x0 and d and apply them and then essentially do a simulation. And so in this way, we can take a set of capital N independent and identically uh, distribute, distributed random uh, sample random variables from a random variable r. And we can use these samples, which are going to act as our data, in order to construct our reachable set approximation. Now, under this setup, we don't have enough information in general to ensure that we can make an over approximation of the reachable set using these data points. So we're instead going to focus on a probabilistic measure of accuracy. And this is based on that probability measure that's defined by the random variable r. And so specifically, we're going to try to construct our reachable set approximation in such a way that the measure of the approximation under this, uh, under this measure is at least 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is some constant between 0 and 1 that we get to choose. And the reason that this is a suitable measure of accuracy is that the probability measure of the true reachable set um, under this measure is 1. And then just by the properties of measures, um, we can say that a, an estimate that contains, um, you know, like if you, uh, that contains more of the measure under, you know, under this random variable is going to become sort of a closer approximation in this sense um, to the true reachable set. Or at least it'll sort of contain more of the probability mass in that way. So it'll contain more of the volume as well. Um, now this um, doesn't actually contain enough this goal on its own, we'll need to add some side constraints onto that, like some sort of minimization on volume. And so we'll see a couple of ways to do that as well. So with this problem set up, so this is sort of the um, statistical reframing of the problem. So next we'll look at a couple of specific instantiations of this, of how we can solve this probabilistic version of reachability. And the first is based on the scenario optimization approach. And this works essentially by again, sort of reframing this statistical version of the problem as a chance constrained optimization problem. And in order to do this, we will impose a little bit of additional structure. So first we're going to suppose that we have um, a set 
like a pre-specified set of reachable set estimates that we're going to consider that are parameterized by some fixed finite dimensional vector theta. And they're going to take the form of sublevel sets as shown here, where you have some function of G of the state X and the parameter theta. And once you fix a theta, the uh, reachable set estimate then becomes the zero sublevel set of the function G with just X being free. And we also suppose that we have a volume proxy, um, a volume of theta, where this is, is essentially some sort of um, rough measure of the volume of the reachable set X estimate for a specific theta. And once we have these two ingredients um, and this scenario-based approach or this sort of optimization-based approach, um, what we're going to do is we will choose the smallest reachable set estimate under the volume proxy that we have that contains at least one minus epsilon probability mass. And so this is sort of um, capturing our goal that we mentioned in the previous part and also including a um, minimum volume um, sort of sub goal as well. And when we have it in this form, sort of shown in the figure on the right, and um, we see that what we get is a chance constrained optimization problem. This is nice because it gives us a sort of direct formalism to work with. Um, but the problem is that these types of chance constrained optimization problems are difficult to solve in general. And they're also difficult to solve even in the convex case, um, because in addition to minimizing that objective, the probabilistic constraint is sort of um, very difficult to show directly that it's been satisfied. And even when all the functions involved are convex, the probabilistic constraint still ends up being non-convex in a lot of cases. Um, so we won't be able to solve this problem directly. But luckily for us, there is a, uh, an approximate approach to solving these types of problems, which is called scenario optimization, where we um, can get approximate solutions to this problem, which solve the original problem with high probability. So I'll discuss the scenario optimization in the next slide and show how it applies to this case. So again, scenario optimization approximately solves um, chance constrained problems, sort of the form shown here, just as sort of a, um, a sort of a prototype case where we're minimizing some um, objective function subject to this probability constraint, um, where we also impose that the parameter uh, live inside of some compact subset of the um, of R n sub theta. And the way that scenario optimization approximately solves this problem is by simplifying it, essentially reducing this um, probabilistic constraint into a sampled based set of constraints. So the relationship going from the top problem to the bottom problem is that we replace the probabilistic constraint with capital N um, simpler constraints, which are essentially driven by these samples from the random variable Z. So we basically take one probabilistic constraint and replace it with essentially a sampled version where we take a bunch of samples and solve it in that manner. And this sort of, um, Intuitively, this gives the notion that by solving a bunch, like ensuring that a bunch of specific fixed instances of this probabilistic constraint are solved, the idea is that this will also give a good chance of the um, full probabilistic constraint being covered as well. So let's take a look at how this transformation uh, looks like for our reachability analysis problem. In this case, we take our original chance constraint problem, and in order to, or when we sample it, we essentially um, ignore the like we no longer try to solve for the um, measure directly, we instead content ourselves to take a bunch of samples, again, from this reachability, reachable set random variable that we defined before. And instead of trying to contain a certain probability mass, we'll just look for the minimum volume estimate or you know, the reachable set estimate that contains all of the sample points. And this is generally a much easier problem to solve. And again, under certain convex assumptions, it can be solved by off-the-shelf hardware and can sometimes turn into standard convex optimization problems. Um, but of course, um, sample containment was not our original problem, right? What we really want is to contain a certain probability mass in order to get probabilistic accuracy. So the question we had to ask is, will the sample-based solution still uphold the original constraint? And the answer is that under certain conditions, we can show that it does still hold with high probability. And this is the basis for our probabilistic guarantee of correctness. So I'll discuss how that works here. So first, um, in order for this probabilistic guarantee to hold, we need a couple of conditions to uphold first. Um, so the first one is that the volume proxy and the sublevel set function G both need to be convex with respect to the parameter theta. Um, I will note, however, that the function G, while it needs to be convex with respect to theta, it doesn't need to be convex with respect to X. So we actually do still have a fair bit of freedom there. And in addition to this convexity requirement, we also need to fix a confidence parameter um, delta between zero and one. So this is a free choice and um, 
the significance of this parameter, I'll explain in just a moment. And once we have these fixed, we also need to ensure that we have a minimum sample size. Um, so our, our sample size, capital N, needs to satisfy the bound shown here, where again, n sub theta is the number of parameters, and e here is just the base of the natural logarithm, so e to the one. So provided that these conditions hold, um, the conclusion of this um, sort of guarantee of correctness is that the reachable set estimate based on the optimal parameter solution of the scenario problem satisfies the probability inequalities shown here. Um, and this is known in statistical learning theory as a probably approximately correct bound or a pack bound. They can be a little bit imposing if you haven't seen them before. Um, so we'll break it down a little bit. Essentially, this probability inequality is stating two things. First, it's making a statement about accuracy. This inner probability equality or probability inequality is the statement that our reachable set approximation contains at least one minus epsilon probability mass. So recall, this is the, the, um, the goal that we want to achieve for our reachable set. And so with the statement of accuracy, the outer inequality is a statement about confidence. So this is basically stating that our reachable set approximation attains this one minus epsilon accuracy with a probability of one minus delta. So we can't show that that um, accuracy holds directly, but we can show that it holds with um, some confidence characterized by one minus delta. And since we're free to choose delta, we can make this arbitrarily small, um, but this does come at a sample cost, right? Because there's a log of one over delta term in the sample size here. So um, for computational purposes, the main point of interest in this um, guarantee of correctness is the sample size, because that's going to determine how many simulations we need to do in order to construct our reachable set estimate, and therefore how much computation we need to do. And so it really all comes down, in addition to choosing epsilon and delta, it all comes down to how many parameters we have. And of course, that's generally going to depend on the state space. So we will find that we have some uh, scaling of the number of samples with the state dimension. And so we'll make this clear with a specific example. So here we're going to consider um, the specific case of ellipsoidal approximations. Um, so here we're going to take our parameters as a matrix A and a vector B. And we're going to take a sub-level set function based on the two norm and a volume proxy based on the log determinant of A. And with this problem data set, uh, the reachable set approximations have a simple geometric form. They're ellipsoids. And when we go through the um, scenario optimization problem or the chance constraint problem and then take the sampling based scenario approximation of it, um, the reachability, uh, you know, the uh, optimization problem we need to solve is just the standard minimum volume covering ellipsoid problem. And furthermore, when we plug um, the necessary values into the sample bound, we have, we have it um, obeys this form here, um, which the exact form that isn't necessary for our purposes here. But I do want you to notice that the number of samples we need is quadratic in the state dimension. So we say that it has quadratic sample complexity. So this is sort of related to the computation complexity, but it's not quite the same thing. This is just telling us how many samples we need. Um, the exact complexity is going to depend on a number of other factors such as um, the computation times required to do a single um, simulation. And so on the right-hand side, we can see a specific example of this. So this is an example taken from a system with the following um, parameters. So it has six states. So this is a based on a three-link planar robot, which is modeling a, uh, a medical exoskeleton. And what we're seeing on the screen here is a projection um, of the reachable set approximation down to um, the x and y uh, center of mass for this problem. And in addition to the fixed state dimension, we also get to choose um, an accuracy parameter epsilon and a delta parameter or a confidence parameter delta. And with the value shown here, we're sort of aiming for a 95% probabilistic accuracy. And with delta being 10 to the minus nine, we are asking for um, the, essentially what the confidence is saying is that the event that we don't meet our 95% accuracy goal is basically going to be a one in a billion event. And so under these conditions, the sample bound um, gives this value here. So it, in order to satisfy this based on the scenario approach with the ellipsoid uh, geometry, we need about 1,500 samples. And so you know this, you'll notice that there are two ellipsoids on the screen here. The orange ellipsoid is the projection of the minimum volume covering ellipsoid. And this blue one here is a slight geometric restriction of that. And so I'll discuss um, how this is useful uh, because it allows us to have some additional control over the sample complexity by adding in some restrictions to the geometry. So like I was saying, by restricting the forms that this ellipsoid can take, 
we can bring down the sample complexity in the case that quadratic sample complexity is too much for our problem. So the, uh, the most free case here under this geometry is just allowing um, any positive definite A matrix and any B vector. And we've seen that in this case, we get quadratic sample complexity. The first thing that we can try is restricting the A matrix to be diagonal and still allowing B to be any vector. And in this case, what we get is um, sort of an axis aligned ellipsoid. So the semi-major axes of the ellipsoid are restricted to be aligned with um, the standard basis vectors. And in this case, we get a reduction in sample complexity from quadratic to linear. And another extreme case we can consider is essentially the simplest possible A matrix, just being some constant times the identity, and also choosing the B vector to be zero. So in this case, we're essentially considering a sphere that's centered on the origin, where the only control we have over it is the radius. This is, of course, a very um, extremely restricted geometry, um, but the uh, but the benefit you get for that is actually a constant sampling complexity with respect to the state dimension. Um, so in a case we have you know, a very extreme, uh, or like a very extremely high state dimension, and you know the reachable set is going to be centered around the origin, um, this would be one approach you could take. Um, so that's sort of the scenario approach um, satisfied. Um, we found this a very general approach, but there are certain um, data-driven methods that we wanted to consider, which we found don't fall into this approach um, at all. And so we do need to consider some other methods for producing these probabilistic guarantees of correctness. And so the Christoffel function approach is one of these. So I'll go into that next. So in this case, instead of dealing with um, optimization problems, we jump straight into a sublevel set solution. And so this is based on a special type of polynomial called an empirical inverse Christoffel function. Um, which has an order parameter k, which basically decides the polynomial degree. So the um, Christoffel function has the form shown here, where in this formula, um, z of k is the vector of monomials whose degree is less than or equal to k. And this big matrix in the middle is the empirical moment matrix, uh, which is sort of like a generalization of a covariance matrix um, to other degrees of moments as well. And so you can see this is how the data is entering the problem. It's through this empirical moment matrix because it contains all the ris, which are the um, reachable set random and variable samples. So with the Christoffel function, we use the minimal covering sublevel set of this function as a reachable set estimator. So this is the smallest sublevel set that contains all of the observed samples. And in this case, this le the uh, level parameters takes the form here um, as the maximum evaluation. And when we do that, we're guaranteed to have the estimator cover all of the samples. Now notice that since the moment matrix is a positive definite matrix, this is actually a sum of squares polynomial or a positive polynomial. And that means that all of these sublevel sets of the Christoffel function are compact. And this is useful in the case where we expect the um, reachable set to be compact, which I think would be most of the time in finite time reachability. However, other than that, we found that the geometry of these sublevel sets is generally quite free. They're not restricted to be convex, like the ellipsoids and scenario optimization that we looked at. And they can also be disconnected as well. Now, um, we were inspired to look at the Christoffel function based on some applications we've seen to it in machine learning and data analysis, where it's experimentally known to perform well. So it has applications in the estimation of supportive random variables and an outlier novelty detection. And so when we've taken this Christoffel function method and applied it to reachability analysis through this statistical formulation, we also find that we get good results here as well. And so this is an example um, of that performance on the right. So this is actually the reachable set for a two-state chaotic nonlinear oscillator. So the gray points here are all the reachable set samples. So you can see that this reachable set has a pretty crazy geometry. And the blue contour is um, the, the reachable set approximation we get with the Christoffel function approach when we take the order to be, or the order k to be 10. So basically with a degree 20 polynomial. And we can see that without even doing any optimization, um, this approach yields an estimate that very closely follows the outer contour of the cloud of data points and also excludes a region within the um, approximation. So this approximation actually has a hole in it in a region where there's, it's sort of devoid of samples. So um, this finding seems to agree with findings we saw before that the Christoffel function method works very well at approximating random variables and thereby reachable sets in our formulation, but good performance isn't enough, of course. Right? What we want to know is, can we provide a guarantee in this case, like we could with scenario optimization? Um, it would be nice if we could apply the scenario approach directly to this problem, but this turns out to not be possible just because the Christoffel function doesn't arise as a minimum volume covering problem. Um, there are a couple of, there are some sort of near misses, but it just doesn't quite match up exactly. So we did a different approach here 
And our current approach is based on statistical learning theory. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I will still present the um, probabilistic guarantee correctness you get out the other end of that. So that's the statement here. So again, we're taking our Christoffel function sublevel set, so each will set estimate. And in this case, we get a sample bound again of the form shown here. So as long as we attain enough samples to satisfy this bound here, then our estimate satisfies another pack bound. So this is of the same form as what we get for scenario optimization. So we actually get the same type of guarantee in this case. Um, but in this case, the problem is that the sample complexity with respect to the state dimension scales um, combinatorially, so very fast, basically. Um, the reason for that being that we have this binomial coefficient term um, showing up inside of the sample bound. And to give you a sense of um, where this can lead, uh, we'll consider the numerics for the example that I showed in the last slide, which we saw had good performance. In this case, we had two states, order 10, and we chose the same probabilistic parameters as the scenario problem. And when you run all this through the sample bound, you get a number of samples required that's 100 times larger than the uh, ellipsoid required from scenario optimization. So we can see here the price that we paid for the um, greater fidelity is essentially needing a lot more samples. Now, this is pretty extreme from a computational point of view. There is a bit of good news, is that our experiments suggest this bound can be improved. So when we do an a posteriori verification of the probability mass of the reachable set estimate we get, we find that it's much, much larger than what the probabilistic guarantee gives. And this suggests that um, it's very likely that we can find a different sample bound that is generally much lower than this one that will still um, you know, be sort of, that'll sort of satisfy the same guarantee. And so a future direction of our research is essentially to look for such a bound using, again, different statistical methods. So I'm going to wrap things up just by sort of going through the computational aspects of these two methods again. So the first thing to note is that the scenario method and the Christoffel method lead to very similar algorithms um, when you get to the computational nitty gritty. For instance, in the scenario method, we first take um, capital N samples from the initial state random variable and the disturbance random variable. And then we apply that to our black box simulation model to get the reachable set random variables. Then we solve the scenario optimization problem. And then in the Christoffel method, we find that the first two steps are the same. So we sample from the distribution that we chose, we apply that to the black box simulation model, and then we compute the Christoffel function in the level parameter. So one thing that I think is interesting is that despite sort of the statistical complexity of the problem, we end up actually with very simple um, algorithms that are basically the form sample and then do a bit of statistical computation. And we find that uh, the bottleneck, of course, of both problems is in computing the samples. So generally the act of applying the black box model to each of the samples to get those reachable set random variables in both cases far outweighs the amount of computation this needs to do to solve either the scenario optimization problem or to do the Christoffel function computations. Um, a bit of good news in this respect is that, you know, this difficult part of the problem is also trivially parallelizable because all the samples can be computed independently. So we do find that we're able to leverage, for instance, um, massively parallel computing platforms in order to do this reachability, which is kind of uncommon for a reachability algorithm to be able to do that. And again, as I mentioned before, another nice thing is that um, in cases where the state dimension is simply too high, um, that even parallelization can't save you, um, these methods do give you a lot of freedom in sort of how much expression you rely on your reachable set estimate, sort of determined by the order of the Christoffel function, for instance, or the number of parameters in scenario optimization. Um, so you can sort of engineer the amount of computation you're allowed to do in that case, with the penalty, of course, being a less accurate reachable set estimate. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks you all very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thank you. So is there any question for Alex? There is no question. OK, then I ask one question. So the, <clears throat> so can you, in the second approach, do you solve an optimization or no? In the Christoffel approach, you don't yes. need to. Like basically what you do is you, essentially from a computational perspective, what you do is 
you compute this empirical moment matrix. Um, so you compute that and store it. And then the other thing you have to do is compute this level parameter. So you basically take each one of your reachable set samples and then essentially evaluate this function using the empirical moment matrix you computed and you store the largest evaluation that you get. And then the largest one of those becomes your sublevel set parameter. I um, see. So with no optimization being done, it's close to an optimization problem. Like I said, we, um, like in our initial um, sort of investigation of this problem, we really wanted it to be a scenario optimization problem. And it's very close to being a minimum volume covering problem where you consider, um, you know, where you do where your um, class of potential estimators is the set of all sum of squares polynomials and your volume proxy is the log determinant of the gram matrix. And what you end up getting out of that is similar to the Christoffel function, but it's not the same thing. What the Christoffel function actually ends up being is a Lagrangian relaxation of this problem, uh, where your Lagrange parameters are all just taken to be the same value. In that case, um, you do get the Christoffel function out. Um, so then you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, one thing regarding the, you had a remark regarding parallelization. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to see how do you do parallelization in the scenario approach because you solve a linear program and that is not necessarily, you cannot parallelize it efficiently, correct? Because of the feasibility. I That's mean, correct. So I was wondering yeah. if this one, the Christoffel functions approximation of reachable set, if this is parallelizable, much better than the other one? Um, parts of it are. I mean, again, the main aspect where both of these algorithms is parallelizable is in the computation of the samples from the reachable set. Um, so for instance, in our implementations, we parallelize that. We don't bother parallelizing either the Grisoffel function computations <laughs> or the scenario optimization, just because it takes up such a smaller fraction. At least it does in the cases that we've looked at. I suppose if you looked at sufficiently complicated um, covering problems in scenario optimization, eventually the optimization would catch up to the sampling. But in a lot of um, a lot of simpler cases, like in the ellipsoid case, the minim minimum volume ellipsoid problem is um, usually pretty fast to solve. And another example that we looked at a lot is actually an interval-based approximation, which is sort of the same thing as ellipsoids, but with the infinity norm. And in that case, you actually don't even need to solve an optimization problem at all. You just sort of compute the um, component-wise minimum and maximum of the samples, and then that's the optimization problem done. Yeah, I agree. So thank you, Alex.